Okay, so this is lecture 22. Uh, it's kind of a denouement to our uh, segment of lectures on constraint satisfaction problems and uh, linear programs and so forth. It's going to be more connected with constraint satisfaction problems. And it's actually related to uh, uh, something I mentioned in the last lecture. Um, this is the topic of tree width. Okay, so uh, it's an interesting phenomenon that uh, on certain kinds of graphs, uh, NP hard problems can become easy. And this is uh, no more notable than on trees. Almost every problem you can think of on a tree is actually doable in polynomial time. So uh, let's take a little example here of how that works. Uh, let's consider again this problem called the max independent set. We're trying to find a subset of vertices in a graph um, that's an independent set, meaning there are no edges uh, with both endpoints in the set you've chosen. And to make it a little spicier, we can imagine the weighted version where the nodes have weights. So I drew little uh, numbers inside each of the nodes in this tree example. And you're trying to take the largest weight independent set. Uh, well, as I imagine you can guess, you can solve this problem uh, in polynomial time using dynamic programming or recursion, if you will. So let me briefly illustrate how that goes in the, maybe the dynamic programming mindset. So I'll use a little notation here. Imagine we're doing this max independent set uh, graph problem on a tree and let V be some vertex like this vertex here. And I'll write T sub V to be the subtree hanging off of this uh, vertex V. And we're gonna do dynamic programming. We're gonna make um, uh, a table, actually two tables, which I'll call MIS plus and MIS minus. In MIS plus uh, brackets V, this entry in the table, is supposed to be the size or the weight of the maximum independent set just in the subtree rooted at V that includes V. Okay, and that's what the, the including V is what the plus stands for. And MIS minus V is going to be the same thing. It's supposed to be the maximum independent set in uh, TV, the subtree hanging off V, that does not include V. Okay, and what we'd like to do is like fill in this table, figure out this value for every vertex V in the tree. And uh, once we have that, we can take a look at the MIS values for the root. And, uh, you know, any independent set either includes the root or doesn't include the root. So the maximum of MIS plus for the root and MIS minus for the root will be the maximum independent set we're seeking. And the point is that it's easy to build this quantity in like a, a bottom-up fashion. So uh, it's easy to fill this in for the leaves, of course. It's a zero for MIS minus, and it's the weight itself for MIS plus. And then in general, if you're trying to fill this out, um, if you have some vertex V, and it has some, uh, oops, it has some children V1, or W1 through WD, then how do you fill out MIS plus of V? Well, this is when you're going to be taking V into your independent set. So on one hand, you get the weight of V, because you're choosing V. But on the other hand, you're not allowed to choose in your independent set any of V's children because uh, it's supposed to be an independent set and you're planning on taking V, so you can't include the children. So you sum over all the children. I don't know why this says goes up to D minus one. It should go up to D. Um, you can scribble that out. Um, oops. Scribble that out. Well, anyway, it goes up to D. Uh, the sum over all the children of the MIS value for the child, which you've already computed, where you don't include uh, the root. And on the other hand, if you want to figure out the MIS value uh, for the subtree root of V where you don't include V, well then uh, you're allowed to take any of the children if you want into your independent set. You don't have to, and it's not necessarily beneficial. So again, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to sum over all children and again, you can take the MIS value for the children when it's optional to include the root or not by maxima, uh, taking the max of MIS plus of the child, MIS minus of the child. Okay, so as this uh, thing I've flashed up indicates, uh, this is a simple correct algorithm for computing the maximum independent set on a tree, and it's a linear time algorithm, which is great. Okay, let's do another example here, example two. Uh, this is like a much more general example, and uh, it's related to something I talked about in the last lecture. So let's say you're given any kind of CSP instance. We'll define this quantity called the primal graph. We defined it last time. This is uh, a graph with vertices and edges. The vertices are identified with the variables of the instance, 
And when you put an edge in the graph, you put an edge between two um, vertices, aka variables, u and v, if they participate in some constraint together. Okay, so there's some kind of like graph underlying the instance of a CSV. Okay, now suppose that you're in a situation where this underlying graph is a tree. Now, to be honest, that's a bit of a um, very uh, particular situation. If you think about it, that means that you must be working with the binary CSP, one where all the constraints only have arity two, because if you have a constraint involving three variables, well then the primal graph will have an edge between all pairs of them, so it'll have a, a triangle and it won't be a tree. But anyway, there's some interesting um, CSPs of uh, arity two, like the three coloring problem, for example. And um, one thing that's true is that if you're given uh, a CSP instance and its primal graph is a tree, then you can decide whether or not it's satisfiable in polynomial time. And again, the algorithm, uh, I'll kind of leave it as an exercise, but uh, you solve it with a dynamic program. And again, you can imagine filling out a table, which I've called S of uh, V comma A, where uh, the V entry stands for a vertex or variable. And this A entry here stands for a domain element. The, the, remember, omega is the domain of things that you're trying to assign to the variables in the CSP. And uh, the uh, intention is that this S V comma A should be true, set to true, if there's some partial assignment, again, to the set of uh, variables or vertices hanging out in the tree rooted at V. Uh, some partial such assignment where v gets the value a and false otherwise. Okay, and it's not too hard to show that with this definition, again, you can, um, you know, build up this table from the leaves up to the roots in a top-down fashion, or a bottom-up fashion, I should say. And uh, once you finally filled it out, then you can just uh, look at the root vertex v and go through all possible domain assignments to it and see if s v comma, you know, i is true for any domain assignment i. Okay, then that way you'll learn if the instance is satisfiable or not. Okay, so that's an indication that, uh, you know, on trees, many, many NP-hard problems are actually easy, can be solved in polynomial time. And what we'd like to explore today is this question on the slide here. Um, is there some more general family than just trees that admit polynomial time algorithms like this for NP-hard problems? Okay, so that's what we'll talk about today. Uh, as always, um, if you have any questions, uh, you can pipe up, but you can also type them into the chat window and I'll answer them as we go. Okay, well, this is a very natural problem. It's been thought about it for a long time, say since at least the 70s. And uh, actually in the 70s, they defined, uh, some people defined a class of graphs, which I'll describe now, called series parallel graphs. And uh, it's more general than trees. And what is a series parallel graph? Well, it, it kind of has a recursive definition. What is a series parallel graph? So uh, this is not an aspect of the recursive definition, but the first thing to say is that in a series parallel graph, you should always think that there's a, a vertex called S and a vertex called T, some special source and target or S and T vertices. Okay, and so now I'll give you the recursive definition. So a uh, base case of the recursive definition is that, you know, a single edge with, you know, the endpoints being called S and T, that counts as a series parallel graph. Okay, and now for the rule by which you build up larger series parallel graphs and how you do it is sort of built into the name. So uh, imagine that you have two series parallel graphs, this green one and this pink one, and they have their own S and T vertices, S and T, and this one has S prime and T prime. Then uh, you can get new series parallel graphs in two ways. Um, First, you can join them up like this. Well, this is the, the series way of joining them up. So you take uh, one S vertex and one T vertex and you glue them together. Okay, and you line them up like this and that's a series connection. Okay, so if you applied that to uh, just an initial edge, you would get, you know, two, uh, length two path. Uh, it's not such a very good drawing. I should really set up a system where I can draw with my pen right now. I'm drawing with my mouse, which is horrible. Uh, okay, and the other possibility is a parallel connection, where you take the two graphs and you actually kind of glue together both the S vertices, like S to S prime, and you also glue together T and T prime, okay? And that's like the parallel connection. So if you did that with uh, just your base case of two, uh, with a single edge, 
then you get like, you know, a graph, a multi-graph that has two parallel edges. Okay, but you can combine these rules in multiple ways and bigger, build up bigger and bigger graphs, and all the graphs that you can get in this way are called the series parallel graphs. Okay, so this here is an example. It's going to be a nice running example of a series parallel graph. I can sort of briefly explain how we got it. Like you can see, for example, it's got a piece that's like this um, four cycle. How do you get a four cycle? Well, you know, first you can take this edge and then you can do a series connection to make a path of length two. And then you can do another series connection to do a path of length three. And then you can do a parallel connection with a single edge to get like a cycle of length four. Okay. Uh, actually, let me go back briefly because there's a question. The question was, in the bottom diagram of the sequential graph between S and T prime is the intermediate node S prime. Yeah, so in this diagram here, this is both T and it's also S prime. So in a series connection, you take like the T of one, series parallel graph and the S of another series parallel graph, which I called S prime for clarity, and you like glue them together. And then that glued together node, you know, it's no longer a special anymore. It's sort of back into like a plain old white node. Um, and like the former S and the former T prime are like sort of the new ST, the new terminals. Okay, so back to this graph, you can sort of see that you'll get like a, you can get a four cycle in this way. And here we have like another four cycle so we can produce both of them and then like connect them in series. That'll be an example of what I was just talking about. It here, it's everything sort of, you should imagine it on its side. Like here we took a series parallel graph whose, you know, S was F and whose T was G and another one whose S was G and whose T was D. And then we attached them together in series. Okay, and then the last step here was we, uh, you know, took a path of length two, which you can easily construct and we joined it in parallel. So I hope that makes some sense. Let me erase this uh, annotation here. Okay. So uh, actually a series parallel graph has a kind of tree decomposition. It's sort of like, it's like a tree that um, represents how the graph was created according to the series parallel rules. So uh, in this series parallel sort of tree decomposition, like each node is either labeled series or parallel and, or it's a leaf. And in a leaf, you just like sort of imagine a single edge. It's like the base case of a series parallel graph. And then like, you know, a, a series node or a parallel node will always have two children. And these will, you know, point down to the two graphs built up, which when combined in series give you the original graph. Okay, I didn't quite say that exactly correctly, but I hope you got the gist of it. Um, so this sort of tree decomposition, like not only, uh, explains what the graph is, but it also explains like how you use the series parallel rules to build up the graph. Uh, so here's an exercise for you. Um, you know, we saw that you can compute the maximum independent set on a tree in linear time. You should also show that, um, if I give you a series parallel graph, you can compute the maximum independent set in linear time. Uh, actually, there's a little question that you might have in your mind here. Uh, I'll let you think about whether you have a question and just say a little bit more. So how do you do this exercise? Well, here's a hint. Uh, the hint is that actually, instead of a table that has two entries, you know, MIS plus and MIS minus, like we had for a tree, you'll sort of have like a four tables, which you might call MIS S plus, T plus, and another one that's like S plus T minus, another one that's like S minus T plus, another one that's called S minus T minus. Okay, and the idea is that like, you know, MIS S plus comma T minus for a series parallel graph is supposed to represent, you know, what is the maximum independent set in the graph if you do include S, but you don't include T. Okay, and one can, uh, this is, you know, the exercise, one can like fill up these uh, MIS tables in a bottom-up fashion, where the bottom-up fashion is vis-a-vis, -vis not the graph itself, but the sort of tree decomposition and the explanation of, you know, the series parallel construction of the graph. Okay, so I didn't, you know, give you all the details there, but I'll let you think about it. Um, Right, so this is a sketch of how you can uh, compute things like maximum independent set on a series parallel graph in linear time. Any questions?
I was hoping you would have a question. There's a little question that you might uh, have, which is, uh, this exercise is easy to accomplish if you don't just have the series parallel graph, but you also have the tree decomposition in your hands. You know, normally in an algorithm's world, you know, if I say, you know, given a series parallel graph, you can do this and that, usually the input is just the graph. Um, but when I told you how to carry out this exercise, I kind of imagined that you also knew the decomposition of the graph. Now, it turns out that you, given just a plain graph like this, that is a series parallel graph, you can actually compute the series parallel decomposition tree in linear time. It's not completely trivial, but it can be done. So either you can accept that result, in which case the whole exercise is fine, or you can imagine that just, uh, I don't know, if the series parallel decomposition is given to you. There's a question, are there seri uh, planar graphs that are not series parallel graphs? That's a very good question. There are planar graphs which are not series parallel graphs. I will show you one. Uh, one such graph is a K4, a complete graph on four vertices. That really is planar because I can add the last edge like this. So wait a minute. Uh, yeah, that is not a series parallel graph. We have to think a little bit about why. And uh, another example, which we'll encounter later, uh, like even more complicated example, is let's say a three by three grid graph. Okay, I didn't show the vertices here, but this is a three by three grid graph. It's planar and uh, it's not series parallel. It's a good question. Uh, ooh, there's some more questions here. Uh, one quick person asked, it doesn't matter where the S and T vertices are in a given series parallel graph. Yeah, good question. So, I mean, uh, really a series parallel graph, um, uh, wait, actually, you're making me question myself. Uh, like, if you have a series parallel graph, can you now say, like, oh, this is going to be my S and this is going to be my T for a subsequent uh, application of the series parallel rules? Uh, I should know this, but I think you cannot. I think you have to remember, like, the specific S and T. Let's see if I can uh, uh, figure this out on the fly. Because I'm quite sure that um, this guy, K4, or, uh, is not a series parallel graph. Uh, on the other hand, like this one, this graph here is a series parallel graph. So if you could get this graph with this vertex being S, and the top vertex being S, and the top vertex being T, then you could just, you know, in parallel, add this other edge and get K4. But I guess the natural way to get this thing, this uh, quadrilateral with uh, an, a chord, you know, going from here to here, is actually to, you can first, is the only way I can think to get it would have, you know, the sides as S and T. Um... So perhaps, okay, uh, this is belying my lack of knowledge a little bit, but perhaps like a series parallel graph, a graph with no specific S and T only counts as a series parallel graph if there exists a place to call S and T such that you can build it up from the rules. But to be 100% honest, I don't know. So somebody might want to Google that while I'm speaking. Uh, there's another question. Can you construct a tree uh, with some degree more than three in series parallel graphs. Ah, let me actually, uh, one thing I can say is uh, shortly we're gonna sort of augment the class of series parallel graphs. We're gonna like take them as our nice set of graphs and also allow you to delete vertices if you want and delete edges. Um, and there you can build like, you know, trees of any arity uh, by taking a series parallel graph and deleting vertices and edges. Somebody else said, wait, for the diamond-shaped graph, the top and bottom vertices cannot be S and T, right? Yeah, that's my point. Like for this graph here, let me do, do it in a different color. Um, so this graph that has like four vertices, it's like a diamond in this like cross edge. 
You can build it up from the series parallel rules where the degree three vertices have, are the S and the T. But I don't think you can build it up with having the degree two vertices, the top and bottom be S and T. And therefore you cannot uh, you know, add this extra edge here to make a, a copy of K4. Okay, so I guess, you know, without a series parallel decomposition, I guess the series parallel decomposition like remembers what vertices are S and T. And uh, if you don't have that, then just a plain graph would be said to be series parallel if you can build it with some pair of vertices being S and T. Okay, hopefully that uh, makes sense and is all correct. Um, eventually we're gonna define a generalization of these graphs, which uh, will let us not worry about these details, but um, yeah, it's good to get the definition right. Okay, so this is uh, the other question I was answering. Um, you know, this exercise where you can in linear time solve, let's say, max independent set on a series parallel graph, it also works for subgraphs of series parallel graphs. Basically, these are only make your life, you know, no more difficult. And therefore, you can get things like, you know, these trees. 